Let's go, Brandon. That's the only let's go, Brandon cheer I will allow today. What's up, Netroots? How you doing today? Okay, maybe another drink and we'll be more energetic than that. Uh, it is an incredible honor to share a stage with folks like Randy, and I know Congresswoman Omar is coming up in a bit. Uh, it's been an honor to enjoy my not only first trip to Pittsburgh, but also my very first Netroots Nation conference with you all. Thank you. Hope it's not my last. I've been actually pinching myself backstage to, to make sure it's real, and part of that is because I never imagined that any of this was possible for me. Six years ago, up until that point, I, I didn't have grand dreams of stages like this or moments like these. You know, growing up as a queer young kid of color, most of my life was just about trying to find a place to belong. I grew up in a small rural town just outside of Portland, Oregon that didn't look a lot like me, didn't live a lot like me, and even the adults that I appreciated most, the ones that I looked up to the most in the world told me that the world was probably just never going to be ready for someone like me. I didn't have grand dreams of stages like this one because I didn't think they were possible for people like me. I just spent decades trying to find a shred of normalcy in all of this. I found that. Piece by piece, clawing my way to that normal. But June 11th of 2016 was the last normal day of my life. It was normal by all accounts. It was a Saturday, it was laundry day, which meant I was knee deep in socks and underwear on the couch. I was watching reruns of Star Trek The Next Generation on Netflix. I am a nerd, I admit. It was a summer day in Florida, which meant I spent time by the pool. I fell asleep on a lounge chair. And then as the sun was going down, I did the most normal thing. I texted my best friends and asked if they wanted to go and get a drink. Just before midnight, my best friends, Drew and Juan, got to my apartment. We listened to the same playlist we always listened to, watched the same music videos we always watched. I was almost never allowed to have control of the cocktail shaker because I make drinks one or two times as strong as they need to be. We're trying to get the party started. But that night they relinquished and just grimaced every time they took a sip. When it came time to choose where we were going to go, we just picked a club we'd been to a hundred times before. Pulse Nightclub was a safe space for us. It's one of the safest spaces I ever knew. And I get that that term comes with its own baggage, a safe space. It's used almost like a bludgeon online, right-wing trolls insinuating that if you need a safe space in this world, you must not be tough enough to handle it as it is. But for people like us, for queer people, especially queer people of color, safe spaces are lifelines. They're refuges we carve out for ourselves in a world that threatens violence against us every single time we walk out the door. Everything about that night was normal. The line outside the club was as long as it always was. There was this angry drag queen at the front door who always snatched my $5 out of my hand. You part a beaded doorway and walk into the club. We went to the same bartender we always went to, ordered the same drinks we always ordered. We had a spot on the patio underneath the stars where we would gather, and after a drink or two, Drew, who had a master's degree in clinical psychology, would offer you a free therapy session, whether you wanted it or not. That night, he talked about love and compassion. He wondered aloud why we let the little things get in the way of how much we care about each other so much. He was frustrated by a world that only sees how different we are instead of how alike we really are. And when he was coming in for a landing on his point, he, he had these long gangly arms and he would drape one over your shoulder to really drive it home. He draped his arm over my shoulder that night and he said, you know what I wish we did more often? is tell each other that we love each other. It was just a few moments after that that the most normal night of my life after the most normal day of my life became the extraordinary tragedy that you all know it to be. Just after 2 o'clock in the morning, I was washing my hands at a bathroom sink. I, I remember 
For some reason, the poster above the urinal on the wall, the painted faces of drag queens I was familiar with. I remember this plastic cup teetering on the edge of the sink, looking like it might fall off. I remember how cold the water was from the faucet. I remember the first sound of gunshots, the hair standing up on the back of my neck. I remember the feeling of panic washing over me. I remember huddling against a wall, debating whether or not I should run or hide. A dozen people rushing in, the looks on their faces like they had seen the purest form of evil. I remember the smell of blood and smoke in the bathroom, the girl behind me trying so hard not to scream that she was trembling, vibrating against the floor. I remember locking arms with this dozen people whose names I don't know and faces I wouldn't recognize today, making a run for it. I remember the, the smoke machine fog filling the room, the relentless gunfire, bang, bang, bang in the background. I remember halfway through the dance floor in the separate bar asking myself why I didn't get a chance to say goodbye to my parents, because I was convinced that I was going to die in there. And then I remember relief, a door, an emergency exit flung open, a door that I didn't even know was there until that moment. And suddenly I was standing in a parking lot, the stars and blood and smoke and confusion, but relief because I had done the impossible, I had survived. But it didn't take long for that relief to be fleeting when I remembered that my best friends, my chosen brothers, Drew and Juan, were standing in the center of the main dance floor right in that man's line of fire. In the early hours of June 12, 2016, a man charged through the front doors of the safest space I knew, armed with a Sig Sauer MCX assault rifle and thousands of rounds of ammunition. He poured over 110 rounds into a space that I could navigate with my eyes closed. 19 of them struck and killed my best friends. They became two of 49 people, mostly LGBTQ people of color who were murdered in the club that night. I didn't get in the fight against gun violence or for LGBTQ rights because I had grand dreams of stages like this one. I got in the fight because I was mad as hell, so mad at a system that had forsaken us, so mad at a system that seemed determined to put people's political ambitions over the safety of the American people, so furious at a system that kept propping up the faces of cisgender, heterosexual white men on every cable news platform while they wondered aloud how our tragedy, the murders of our friends, would play in the next presidential election cycle. I was so angry at a system that failed us, that failed my best friends by putting the profits of the gun lobby over their lives. I've seen a lot over the last six years. I've watched politicians say all the right things while the cameras are rolling and then triangulate behind closed doors every bit of it about getting themselves to the next spot in their career. I've come face to face with the corrosive influence of money in politics, watching people in real time be bought off. And I'll be honest, living in Ron DeSantis' Florida, it can sometimes feel like it's all hopeless. But I have learned a few things along the way. Like the fact that it really matters who's in positions of power. And I know that sounds like common sense and I'm probably preaching to the choir, but let's face it, in this country, elected officials who care about their constituents and are ready to do the work feel like the exception and not the rule. Allies, born of convenience, they show up for the photo op. Those politicians who tell us they're allies, they show up when the going is good, but it's accomplices who are on the front lines with us, organizing in our communities. It matters when we put accomplices, not casual allies, in positions of power in this country. And it doesn't... It doesn't just matter when they're sitting in a desk in the Oval Office, it matters on every level of government. It matters when you have accomplices in school board meetings and city commission meetings. It matters when those accomplices serve in the state legislature. I have learned that so much of the fight that is being waged is being waged on a state to state level. Right-wing extremists have invested everything they've got 
in holding our local and state governments hostage. They are reaping the benefits of that work. And if we are going to fight back, we have to fight back by growing power from the ground up. I've also learned to be confident. Confident in the fact that we will win because we are right. And I want to say that again. We will win because we are right. I am confident in that. Six days after the shooting, we held a funeral service for Drew. It's one of the hardest days of my life. His mom asked me to be a pallbearer that day, and I found myself as I was pushing the casket down the aisle, gripping the pall so tightly that my knuckles were turning white. It's because I didn't want to let go of my best friend until I'd found the right words to say goodbye. We got to the front of the church. I looked down at that polished wooden box and I made him a promise. I promised him that I would never stop fighting for a world that he would be proud of. That promise has never been about me. It's always been a battle cry for all of us because a world that Drew would be proud of is a world that all of us can be proud of. It's a world that we deserve. Listen, friends. Progressives win when we are unapologetic about our vision for a better future. We need to stop being so damn scared of our own shadows and stand in the light. Progressives win. Progressives win when we are unashamed of our values and when we are unafraid to say loudly and clearly that we can do better than this. Progressives win when we refuse to let the right wing divide us up and instead insist that this country can only be a leader if we refuse to leave anyone behind. And finally, progressives win when we keep our eyes locked on, not on what can't be done or what might be too hard, but on what is possible, the beauty of what is possible. I made a promise to my best friend that I would never stop fighting for a world that he would be proud of. That world is what's possible, but it's only possible if we're willing to fight for it. Thank you.